I hope this won't be the last update I write to dead wrong. That's because the main outstanding issues, whether the investigation into the murder of Christopher Wallace will be reopened, or, more likely, the Los Angeles County District Attorney can be compelled to explain why its office hasn't prosecuted the killers of Notorious B.I.G., have not been resolved. I'm sworn to secrecy about what I know of where things stand on those two points, so I can't say more. I do want to pass on some other information I've acquired, all of which strongly supports the theories of deceased LAPD Detective Russell Poole and retired FBI agent Phil Carson about Biggie's assassination. This comes from four sources. The first is what I've learned as a result of the publication of Dead Wrong. The second is what I've been told by a friend of David Max who has known Max since he was a boy. The third is additional information Phil Carson has provided in interviews with podcaster Don Sikorsky about the photographs removed from the LAPD's murder book on the Wallace case. Last but not least is what Nick Broomfield revealed in his follow-up to Biggie and Tupac, the new documentary Last Man Standing. Not long after the publication of Dead Wrong, Xavier Hermosillo called to tell me he had been contacted by a retired LAPD detective who said he knew exactly what had happened to that disappeared photograph of Michelle Park standing in a red dress between David Mack and Rafael Perez. He knew, this detective said, because he had been ordered by then, LAPD Chief Bernard Parks personally to obtain that photograph and to destroy it. I was never able to get the detective's name or speak to him myself, but Hermosillo believed what he said and I have never been given any reason to doubt the word of Hermosillo. And I know that something happened to that photograph, which has never been seen again since Paul Burns's board of rights hearing. More recently, a person who has been a close friend of David Max for decades contacted me after what he said were seven or eight viewings of the film City of Lies, which is based on my book Labyrinth. I had an odd conversation with this individual, odd because even though the person was revealing damning information about Max role in the Wallace murder, he made considerable effort to portray his friend David in a sympathetic light. I've since independently verified this individual's relationship to Mac with evidence submitted at Mac's trial for the Bank of America robbery. What I learned from him about Mac's background especially struck me. I hadn't been aware that Mac was abandoned by his parents as a child and raised, to use the term loosely, by people who did a poor job of caring for him. I also hadn't known that Mac, just like Rafael Perez, was the child of a black father and a Hispanic mother, and that this was part of the bond between the two. According to his old friend, Mac was living more or less on the streets of Compton from an early age, stealing food just to feed himself as a boy of nine or ten. He joined the mob Piru Bloods at the age of 13, mainly as a way of seeking some form of protection and connection, and remained a mob Piru at least until his release from prison as a man in his 50s. A legendary Los Angeles track coach, Joe Voke, discovered Mac and developed his talent as a runner, helping to obtain his athletic scholarship at the University of Oregon. While at Oregon, Mac lived a sort of double life, one as a successful college athlete who was popular with people of all races, and another as a Bloods gang member who was mob pyro all the way whenever he came back to Compton. Though Mac married in college, he was carrying on an affair with the world record-holding sprinter Florence Griffith Joyner during all that time and for years afterward. According to his friend, Mac had naked photographs of Flojo all over the walls of his room near the university campus. The really important information Mac's friend provided was, of course, about the Wallace murder. Russell Poole had it exactly right. This person told me Mac had been hired by Suge Knight to arrange the shooting that took place outside the Peterson Automotive Museum. And just as Poole had come to believe, Mac coordinated that shooting with help from Rafael Perez and other LAPD. Mac personally contracted with his friend Amir Mohammed to be the triggerman. What Poole apparently didn't know, though, Mac's friend said, was that the primary target outside the Peterson that night was not notorious B.I.G., but rather Puffy Combs. Biggie wasn't the intended target. Puffy was. I told our driver, Kenny, Kenny, run his next three lights. Run the light, Kenny. Kenny ran the light. Big stopped at the light. Big get killed. Wasn't meant for him, bro. But they was also supposed to kill Sean Puffy Combs. And he didn't get it done. And he said, we just missed Puffy, Sean Combs. 
It was Puffy's sheer good luck that the SUV he was in had been able to blow through a yellow light where the vehicle Biggie was in would stop on the red moments later. Mac had guaranteed Muhammad a considerable sum of money, $200,000, Mac's friend said, though he admitted he wasn't sure of the amount, to execute Puffy and Biggie. The problem was that Suge Knight said he wasn't paying for a job that was only half done, less than half done, in fact, as far as he was concerned. Puffy was who Suge really wanted dead. According to his friend, David is a very loyal person, very loyal, and he felt Muhammad was owed. He'd given his word. But he didn't have that kind of money. That was why he robbed the bank, to pay Muhammad. Only after Mac's arrest did Suge Knight acknowledge his own vulnerability to criminal charges in connection to the Biggie slaying, the friend said, and offered to pay for Mac's attorney. In return, Mac agreed to maintain his silence. For those of you who may not know, it's been stated that Mac's criminal defense attorney, Donald Ree, was paid for by Suge Knight. When Mac was deposed and asked if this was true, he pleaded the fifth. Don't believe me? Here are excerpts from earlier in this book breaking down exactly what I'm referring to. By far the most revealing aspect of the deposition was Mac's assertion of his right to refuse answering questions that might incriminate him. It was no surprise that he pleaded the fifth to avoid answering any questions connected to the Bank of America robbery. Mac's more telling Fifth Amendment claims, though, came when he refused to answer whether attorney Donald Ree had represented him in his trial on the bank robbery charges. Ree was Mac's defense lawyer in that case, and there was no risk of self-incrimination in saying so. At the time, attorneys who watched the trial had wondered how Mac could afford one of the most expensive attorneys in L.A. The defendant may have stolen more than $722,000 in the Bank of America robbery, but it was difficult to believe he could access that money from jail, and there was no way a lawyer as smart as Ree would risk being paid with stolen funds. What Mac was concerned about became clear only when Frank asked the next question, had Ree been paid for his services with funds provided by Suge Knight? He was refusing to answer based on his Fifth Amendment right to avoid self-incrimination, Mac replied. Donald Ree was one of the attorneys hired to work on Snoop Dogg's murder case alongside David Kenner and others. So, he had already established a relationship with Death Row. David Kenner, you know what I'm saying, put on the bomb, bomb case. Donald Ray, Marshall Morrissey, Paul Palladino, the whole dream team. It's probably hard for you to understand, but for David, doing 15 years in prison, Mac served not quite 14 years, including time spent at jails in Los Angeles County, was not something that worried him. He accepted it as part of the deal. He never would have snitched. Again, according to his friend, Mac came out of prison a different person than he went in, has been steadfastly faithful to the wife he cheated on many times over many years before serving time, and is devoted to his grandchildren. Whether any of the money from the bank robbery was waiting for Mac when he got out of prison, the friend admitted not knowing, though he doubted it. If there was any, I don't think it was that much. Mac is still living in the modest Los Angeles house he owned when he was an LAPD officer, the friend noted, and truly does work at his green energy business, which has received considerable financial support from various government grant and tax programs. David doesn't worry about the Biggie murder at all, his friend said. He knows the LAPD never wants the case solved, and that because of that, it never will be. As I wrote in Dead Wrong, Phil Carson had described to me viewing the LAPD's murder book on the Biggie case on two separate occasions, once when he got back channel permission from then, Deputy Chief Jim McDonald to see it but not make copies, and a second time when he met with the detective who had succeeded Russell Poole as the lead investigator, Steve Katz. The first time he looked at the murder book, Carson said, it had included a number of photographs of police officers that had been present at the Peterson Automotive Museum on the night of March 9, 1997. When he was shown the murder book officially by Katz weeks later, though, Carson said, those photographs had been removed. After Dead Wrong was published, Carson was interviewed by Don Sikorsky for Sikorsky's podcast The Dossier. 
During those interviews, the former FBI agent stated for the first time publicly that the photographs removed from the murder book had included some of David Mack and Rafael Perez that had been taken at the Peterson Museum during the Soul Train after party. I can't say that Carson gave me a really satisfying answer as to why he hadn't named Mack and Perez when he spoke to me. My surmise is that he had saved this for Sikorsky, with whom he had a relationship that long preceded our interview. It was Sikorsky who had helped me arrange my interview with Carson, and Don was present for most of it. Be that as it may, Carson has confirmed to me more than once, including during my own appearance on Sikorsky's podcast, that photographs of Mac and Perez at the Peterson Museum were part of what had been removed by Katz, he assumed when he saw the murder book the second time. Absolutely game-changing information, Wallace State Attorney Perry Sanders called this revelation. They not only hid those photos from the FBI, they hid them from us during our lawsuit. That's huge. Equally significant, Sanders said, was Nick Broomfield's interview with Layla Steinberg in Last Man Standing. Steinberg is a former backup singer and dancer who has a good many other resume lines. Among these is holding poetry classes in Oakland, where one of her students was Tupac Shakur. Tupac later lived with Steinberg's family and hired her as his first professional manager. She also knew David Mack very well, having worked with Mack as a trainer when he was preparing to run the 800 meters at the 1984 Olympics. Steinberg's recollections to Broomfield that she had seen both David Mack and Rafael Perez at the Peterson Museum on the night of the notorious B.I.G. murder is the best on the record evidence to date that the two were present at the scene of Biggie's slaying. She told Broomfield also that Mack had accompanied her to video shoots involving Death Row Records rappers and that she had known long before the night of Biggie's murder that Mack was working off-duty to provide security for other Death Row rappers. Broomfield had set up Steinberg's appearance in his film by giving Greg Kading one more chance to make his patently false claim that Mack and Perez had no involvement with Death Row Records. The director cut from Kading to a pair of former Death Row bodyguards, C-Style and Joe Cool, who recalled seeing Mack and Perez at various Death Row events and in the company of Suge Knight. I think Nick came away feeling just as much contempt for Kading as you and I do, Sanders told me. The really sad fact isn't that Kading may never receive the public repudiation he deserves, it's that the truth about the murder of Christopher Wallace will never be established unless his mother, widowed wife, and now grown children can agree to push forward with their civil claims. I had expected it to happen long before now, but I've seen the chances of it happening growing gradually slimmer since Dead Wrong was published. The one conversation I had with Valletta Wallace after the book's publication encouraged me to believe she would move ahead. But there has been one delay after the next. The coronavirus pandemic was the single greatest cause of those delays, but not the only one. I am only able to say that there are attorneys still working to bring this case back to court and that it is nowhere near to dead in the water yet, as one of them put it to me. Hopefully, I will be writing a new and much more detailed update to Dead Wrong in the not-so-distant future.